that so that these were my coping mechanisms and I was always trying to help someone else out to the detriment of my own self because you know it, it was like I was a doormat I created that and so it technically was my own fault but people don't understand and it took me a long time to figure this out is that you have to have a loving relationship with yourself that's first and foremost Welcome to Linda's Corner, where we bring more hope, healing, and happiness to the world. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about healing from trauma. I'm delighted to welcome Birgitta Visser. Birgitta is a healer trained in multiple modalities, the founder of Power Soul Healing, and the author of Becoming Authentically Me. You can reach Birgitta at her website, powersoulhealing.com, and I'll include a link in the show notes. Welcome, Birgitta. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. Hi, Linda. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I love, I love it. Hope, healing, and happiness. H H H Triple H. Isn't that wonderful? I think what we are all searching for are one or a combination of those things. I want some hope that things are going to be better than they currently are. I, I want some healing. I, I don't feel I don't feel awesome inside, or I'm not enjoying the happiness that I know I've seen other people. I know it exists. I want some of that. And so that is what we're, we're going for. And I really appreciate your message of healing from trauma, because this is something that many people experience. And ironically, not everyone who is experiencing these tremors from the past, even recognize that that's part of why they feel the way they do today. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, if we begin with your story of what you have gone through and your choices and how you became the happy, happier person that you are today. Yeah, because I'm still a work in progress. I think we're all still work in progress. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> well, for me, I mean, I was born in 1974. And um the first couple of years of my childhood were great. And then we moved to Singapore and Malaysia. And then I got abused by a friend of the family because we my dad went kind of bankrupt. And uh, so we moved in with a business partner of his. And um, yeah, it's the 1980s were very different to what life is like today. So it wasn't really talked about. I didn't even know what was going on. And for me, I just had to touch him through his clothes and it was just weird and he would rub himself against me. But then I've always had these kind of weirdos in my childhood, um, even in, at school. Um, it was a teacher who taught Bahasa Malay. And my sister kept saying that whenever the teacher was checking my exercises, because, you know, we, we would go to the teacher's desk, he would just rub his hands all the way up uh, from the bottom of my leg all the way up. And she told my parents, my parents told the principal and I was called in and I had to write down exactly what happened. And for like a 10 year old, that's pretty traumatic. So, but they fired the teacher and I didn't understand because I felt really bad that he was fired. And so I carried that with me, even though they said, you know what, you've done nothing wrong. Your teacher did something wrong, but try and explain that to someone that's 10 years old. So I carried that with me. And then I was bullied when we went returned to Holland. I was 13, nearly 14. And then at the age of 14, my dad passed away, coronary heart disease. He just he went biking. I mean, he was in the hospital a, a few months prior, but then he went biking, didn't take his medication, and he fell off his bike, boom, gone. So that was, and, and as I said to you, it's exactly 35 years ago today. And it normally doesn't really hit me. But today was just, it was a very strange day for me. And I, you know, it's not just that. And I think because I also lost two other friends this month. And life is short, Linda. Life is really short because you're never guaranteed tomorrow. And that's one of the things that's so important to not live with what would have been, what could have been, or what ifs. It's really about empowering yourself and really going after your dreams and blowing life back into your dreams. I say that now, I mean, you know, back then it was a little bit different, but 
so yeah, I did get bullied at school because I was very, very skinny and I, I, I was very insecure, had no confidence and it was just very difficult. And I think losing a parent is always difficult as well because, you know, the other half is gone. So we just had our mom and my sister and I, well, you know, we walked around in second hand clothes because my dad left, left my mom with nothing. So my mom had to start from scratch, which, you know, was fine. My mom is very, very strong. Uh, and she's a survivor. She really is. I mean, she's had a difficult youth herself. So she had that survive, these survival skills. And I think she did a pretty darn good at raising us. Uh, she really, really did. And I'm thankful that she was very strict with us. I mean, at the time you think, you know, why is my mother so strict? Why can't I do this? And why can't I do that? But you know what? It is actually for your own benefit, because later in life, you look back and you think, you know what, thank God my mom was the way she was. I mean, yeah, I mean, I have a very good bond with her now. We're very close. Um, but, but back then I was like, why do I have to do this? Because you know, me and my sister had to help out in, in the household. And we started where I started working when I was 15 and still going to school just to help out with the rent. And that was normal in those days. Um, so yeah, and I remember even making breakfast for my mom and dad when I was like five or six years old. Wow. That was kind of normal. It was just, yeah, we, my sister and I just did that on Sundays. So, and we always had to clear, you know, clear up our room because that was normal. So, but for me growing up and especially, you know, I wanted to be invisible and it was very hard for me, even at school. Uh, with guys walking around in the hallways because I I was so scared of them so scared of them that when I had to go to a classroom and there was a guy in front of another classroom and I had to get to mine I didn't dare to pass him I was so scared I would take another route that and that's ridiculous isn't it but that that's how ingrained that fear was within me and I didn't heal at the time so my mom put me on this course to a modeling course to crick up my confidence because I was really hunched over like the hunchback of Notre Dame, wanting to be invisible. That's how bad it was. And um, he picked me out. There was a hairdresser that picked me out, picked me out from, from a lineup and asked me if I wanted to do a hair show. And I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? I was going to be one of the main models. And it was going to make me like 75 guilders. I don't even know how much that is these days because it doesn't exist anymore. But I had hair till about here and he chopped it into a pixie cut. That that, that did not bode well for my confidence. I felt yeah. ugly. <laughs> I felt horrific looking in the mirror. I was just like, no, but I had no choice. <laughs> so, I mean, I made the 75 guilders, but I didn't feel better for it. And um, I tried my hand at the modeling industry. I really, really did, but I could never live of it. I mean, I, you, you, honestly, I don't even understand how how models lived of it. But then there was a lot of sleeping sleeping around going on, and I was too naive, and I was fit. I wasn't as thick skinned, and I was often compared to the likes of Brooke Shields or Linda Evangelista, and I just wasn't getting any work. And in New York, I was actually assaulted by a hairdresser in the industry yeah it was uh that was something else I carried around with me for a long time and I never went to the police it's just it uh, you know and this was early 2000 probably 2001 so it's a long time ago now and even my relationships are very dysfunctional I was a late bloomer I was 21 and a half when I met my first boyfriend and because I was so broken I was trying to fix others. You know, relationships were like a refurbishment project to me because I didn't have a good <laughs> relationship with myself. Honestly, it was like broken bird seeks another broken bird to fix up. And <laughs> I was really trying to fix them and trying to mold them to my ways, but you have to live this way, but you know, and it, it wasn't like that. It shouldn't have been like that. But it's just one of these things that what you attract because that's exactly the energy you hold within. So what you vibe out, that's exactly what you reel back in. 
um, these beautiful soul mates, they were mates to, as, as I always say, mates to finding my way back to my own soul, because I was just I was always playing whack-a-mole with my emotions. I was suppressing them and living with very regimented coping mechanisms. Because I was I was a pro at starving myself. I really, really was, because that's what kept I could control that. And I worked like a maniac. I always had different jobs. Doesn't matter. It didn't matter where you put me, whether I was legal in the US or not. I was bartending like crazy. I was hostessing. I was doing promotional work. So money for me was never an issue, but that, so that these were my coping mechanisms. And I was always trying to help someone else out to the detriment of my own self, because, you know, it, it was like, I was a doormat. I created that. And so it technically was my own fault, but people don't understand. And it took me a long time to figure this out is that, you have to have a loving relationship with yourself. That's first and foremost. And if you don't allow the other person to grow, to walk their own journey, you stump their growth as much as you stump your own growth. Wow. Okay, this is, I appreciate so much you sharing. And my heart just aches for not only what happened, but for what the interpretation is of what happened. Because we all have events that happen in our life. Yep. And then we have the meaning that we attach to that event. Yep. And most of the time, we don't know that we have done that. We don't know that from that point on, we send out a message of, well, I guess my purpose is for other people's pleasure. My purpose is to be the doormat that other people use. My purpose is to uh, whatever. And then when you feel so down and so low and so worthless, we come up with different coping mechanisms. And sometimes those things are not helpful for, for our healing and, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about that, the difference between coping and healing and that choice. Yeah. But I, I, I appreciate how you've brought up just the natural cycle of things, how this is, this is, this is what I do. And now you recognize I did that because this was a coping mechanism. I did this because I wanted something in my life that I felt I had control over. Mm -hmm. or, and I did this because I wanted to fix somebody else because I wasn't ready to fix myself. Yep. And all of these things come so naturally. Now, I would imagine that anyone looking at you would say, oh my gosh, look at this gorgeous, amazing model who's so successful and so beautiful. She has it all together. And I think most people assume that our happiness, our fulfillment comes from the outside in. It's as soon as I wear this dress size, which I'm sure you had that dress size, as soon as I look like this, as soon as I drive this kind of car, as soon as I have this kind of relationship, as soon as I live in this kind of house or in this neighborhood or have mm -hmm. this much in my bank account, then I will be happy and I will be fulfilled. And Brigitte, what you just said is the starting point is to love ourselves. Yes. Yes. So why is that so hard? I mean, we've talked about some of the things that can happen to us that can confuse us. Yeah. How do I know if I love myself? I mean, or do I, do I know if I love myself or don't love myself? That depends if you keep comparing yourself to others. It doesn't matter what other people think of you. It matters what you think of you and how you feel about yourself and that took me a long time to figure out. I mean, I had my stint with drugs. I nearly killed myself after, after my stepdad passed away in 2000 of cancer. 
Um, he was a jovial character. I really, really loved him. But I was very, very close to him because he regarded me as his daughter. And it, it, my mom had just nobody to lean on. So she had she she leaned on me and I just didn't have that support. And I can say, you know, I can point the fingers at other people and say, well, they dragged me into it, but it's not that because it was me. I took these ecstasy tablets. And I took like probably six, seven a night, one night, and I just had a memory loss. So that was terrible. But I quit cold turkey after that because that was no way forward. But again, these are things that I experienced. And I will say this, it does not matter what you go through or how you experience life. Please don't judge yourself because I have done this. We carry these labels of shame or fear of anger or bitterness. Don't do that to yourself. Don't put yourself in that boxing ring and beat yourself up continuously because we are all beautiful souls experiencing life. And it took me a long time to forgive myself and other people and to forgive those that I had been in a relationship with and to just love them for having been part of my life. And I will say this, I mean, in 2009, that's when my turning point came because my ex was a crack addict and he was from the US and he came over to Holland and stayed with me. And I just didn't know. I really didn't know. And it was tough to see someone on crack and nearly dying and with crack hands. And he really wanted to get out of it and become a better man. But in Holland, you also needed, like in the US, you needed to have a social security. Otherwise, they wouldn't take him on. So everywhere he went, they turned him down. And then he landed in bed with the Crips in Holland and then he was held for ransom because he stole from them. And then I helped the police. And it was it, it was a horrendous experience for me. It was very traumatic at the time. And my mom took me out of Holland with, in the space of three days. And then the leader of the Crips in Holland threatened to find me and kill me, threatened to once my ex mm. was found by the police and they deported him back to the US. He said, if I ever find him, You'll find him, you'll never find him because he'll be dead in a ditch somewhere. But I will say this, my ex has turned his life around now. It took him many years, but he's doing very well for himself. And it's really, I think that's amazing. But for me, it was also a turning point, as I said, because I, when I was in the UK, I tried to take my own life and it was a very lame attempt of taking a whole box of ibuprofen. But the next day I woke up and I really thought to myself, I can't go on like this anymore. And so my mom said to me, Brigitte, why don't you go and see a counselor? And I did, Linda. And I remember sitting there telling her the whole story and the only thing she said at the end was like Brigitte you're strong enough you're going to be fine that sit not well that, that did not sit well with me that was not a way forward with me that was an easy way out that is not counseling to me and so I chose the holistic route because that agreed with my spirit but I had to do a lot of research on mine and so I rolled into Reiki, which really helped me. And it was one of these things that eventually I did study as well, level one and level two. And years later, I did my master's. So, and I also taught it, but there were many other healing modalities that I studied like EFT, the emotional freedom technique. So powerful, so simple, yet so powerful. And I studied meditation, became a meditation teacher, um, aroma touch, many other healing techniques because it was all about healing myself. And I was in, I was in, well, I was down. I was so low. I had to pick myself up. Was I borderline depressed? Probably. Was that the only time in my life? No. People think, oh, well, you've overcome this maybe life will turn for turn out for the better from now on but lessons are always it's like you know you're always on this uh, in this circle of experiencing life and for me several years it went okay until I met another um, who's now my ex doing very well in Florida <laughs> um, so but 
again, it was a beautiful, well, a disastrous experience, but it was still a beautiful experience because that's, he was very attached to me. He had a fear of losing me, could not let me go. He had, he had a reckless, he lost his mom, he suffered from depression, and he was just clinging on to me so desperately whilst trying to sort out his own life. It didn't work. And I was in this continuously fight or flight mode because he moved two doors down from me. And so he was always checking up on me. Where are you going? Where are you with? And it was, that's how it was. And I would often just honestly lie in the dark, just crying in my own house. And I actually sold that house that I, I, I sold the first house that I bought in St. Pete's. And then I bought another one because I felt like a failure. That's a, those are the exact words I, I used with my mom. I said, I feel like a complete failure. And I said, I just need to buy another house and do it up. Oh, that didn't come without its <laughs> without its troubles because it was a bit of a money pit. I got ripped off by the builders and I did a lot of the work myself. And I've always been like that. I'm I'm pretty good with DIY. And I just get on with it. I just do it. That's just me. And so uh, it was it, it was only that. Once I'd done the house up, I was still very, very down and that I just cried out to the universe. And I said, you know what, how, how do I change my life? I really want to get out of this funk. And I finally got, I finally started to listen because what often happens, as you know, when we're so slam dumped within our own trauma, we don't, we walk around with blinkers. And it's very hard to get out of that funk. And that's why I can say, yes, maybe I've I strayed in my victimhood, but it's not that I didn't want to get better. I did, but it's not like I came with a cheat sheet to earth. And you know, I had to, we, we all have to figure out how to heal and how to find that inner joy within us. And the only way we're going to do that is by healing ourselves that and I like I said I don't care how you heal it doesn't matter what you believe in but do something to make you feel better every single day for me so I did Kumba which was shamanic healing and from there I even did fire walking I did glass walking I did break the board uh, which was it, it was great it was really great the fire walking I loved it but then at the end right at the end I, I was like, oh my gosh, now I'm going to burn. And then you, I felt the burn and I had to hop off. <laughs> but <laughs> it's everything is mind over matter. And that is the thing. We are mental in nature. And so everything stems from the mind. So if we are very anxious or we hold on to that fear, that's exactly what we create. And that's why I say healing is so, such an important aspect healing our experiences and moving forward with the life that we deserve because we're all deserving of a better life we are all deserving of a wonderful beautiful life so Brigitte as you're sharing you know story part two it's like yep. all these hard things in your youth and then you think woohoo now that's done let's move forward and there are hard things in adulthood and we go yes. from hard thing to another hard thing oftentimes and as you're sharing your story some things impressed me is that you are very open to accepting accountability for your own choices it's not that you know oh, I, I am just a victim and everything happens to me and there's nothing that I can do about it there is some things that happen to us that we really can't control but there are many things that we can and in combination with saying, okay, I accept accountability for my choices. You also said, and I have forgiveness for myself, compassion for myself. And I encourage people to have compassion for themselves. And also you brought in forgiveness for the people in your life who did not serve you well who caused problems this way or that or the other 
And I, like yourself, I believe that that healing, that true healing comes from a combination of love and forgiveness. And the concept of forgiveness is often misunderstood. Sometimes people think it means that I'm saying, oh, that's okay. When often it is not okay, and it will never be okay, what their action was. But forgiveness to me means I choose to let this experience go. I release it. I don't need this abuse or trauma or heartache or whatever situation. I don't need that to be a part of me anymore. It's not serving me. So I choose to let it go. I loved that you were uh, willing to begin healing and trying a counselor. And I, and I think it is absolutely okay that you said, this method did not work for me. So I'm going to keep looking. And I think that is awesome. I love that there's more than one way to heal. I love that there's more than one way to do things. So if someone is struggling and they try something, rather than saying, well, that didn't work, I give up. That's okay that that didn't work for you. Let's try something else. And you have gone for lots of different kinds of things and found success. And I think that that is absolutely beautiful. I am so happy that you found something. And now you help other people because maybe other people are saying, you know what? Those things that work for you, they work for me too. Yeah. Yeah. I will say one thing. I did try in the very, very beginning, I did try NLP programming neuro-linguistic programming because I read the book by Brendan Bayes and I went to see a therapist and I did the whole sequence of getting in a rocket sitting around the fire pl- the, 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 the fireplace or, or the fire and um, forgiving these people but after two hours I just what happened to me was the next couple of days I was very tearful it was like a can of worms had been opened up and so I called up the therapist and rather than seeing me again, she did 15 minutes over the phone and that caused a whole, it just, my life kind of blew up um, and all these insecurities at the time came back. And this was prior to me going to the US. So this is prior to 2000, so a very long time ago. And many years later, I called up um I called up the office and they said, well, that is not allowed. Who was the therapist? I said, listen, this is, <laughs> this is uh, probably 15 years ago. I have no idea who it was. And she's like, it is not allowed. If something is not right, they have to just make book, book another appointment with you and just, you know, root out the, the trauma rather than you remaining with that, with that trauma. So that was an experience that wasn't right for me. But that these like an experience that wouldn't be right for anyone to open that can of worms oh, yes. without <laughs> having the power and the tools to then dismiss that can of worms. Yeah. That that's that's painful because trauma feels present anyway. Even yeah. though we're trying with our hardest to bury it down, it, it getting close to it hurts. Yeah, yeah, it does. But that, that was just one of my experiences. I mean, for me, my healing journey continued. And, you know, I uh, channeling is my thing. I love to channel and convey messages from the many light beings out in the universe um, and, and, and do my light language as well. So that's how I help people nowadays. And it's really, like I said, it's really about empowering others to help heal themselves and to know that life can really be better once you take accountability for your experiences, regardless when they happened, it doesn't matter. Even if it's not your fault, do not point fingers because at the end of the day, you're responsible for how you decide how your life will unfold. And if you choose to remain within that victimhood, that is entirely up to you, but is it serving you? Probably not. I don't think victimhood serves us. No. I think empowerment serves us. 
And I love the idea of helping people be able to have the power. So let's say we're going through the story. We open a can of worms, but now I know what to do. Yeah. I, I know how to release this worms so that I can feel okay. Well, life, as we have been describing this past, you know, conversation, more things happen. Life happens, yes. or maybe another memory will resurface, and then we have something new. Mm -hmm. I'm okay now because yeah. I know what to do about it. Yes, I have that training. I have that power that I can forgive. I can let go. I can be at peace. I can take the event. I can take that meaning that I put to the event and yes. release the meaning, and then the event itself just happened it happened absolutely, absolutely. So, and, so, mm, and the, the one other thing i want to touch on at, that we spoke about just before the show is don't think my life is better roses because even now i'm going through things i nearly suffered and burned out twice this year and so i had to take i'm now taking it down and well i can't really take it down and watch but because I have a crazy corporate job and I do the spiritual work and I'm a bit of a superhuman, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I felt a little bit of a burn. And, you know, it, for me, I realized that the corporate's not everything. It really, really isn't. And only because I lost two friends this month, the month of July and life is too short. It really is never live with what ifs or what could have been what should have been just live live your dreams now you know blow life back into your dreams it's so important because people like to remain in their own comfort zone but it's getting out of that comfort zone or people have intentions but they're not doing the do they're just remaining they just sit there and like oh but i would really like this in my life well you have to have, it's great you have the intent, but you have to take the actions in order to get there. I agree. I think that the what makes the change are small and simple action steps. So do you yes. have any action step that you can share with those who are listening today? What's one thing I can do to help me feel more power or more happiness or? What there are, are many. Things? Yeah. There are many things that you can do. I always say, listen to, for instance, David G, um, J.I. Uh, on YouTube. And these are meditations at 20 minutes to start of your day, whether you're suffering from anxiety or fear, or just have to recenter yourself because people always forget to breathe. Breathe. Yeah, especially when it comes to Breathing when meditating, it's people all often breathe till here, till like the chest and the rest they forget. But it's very important to oxygenate the whole of your body. And by doing the breath work, whether it's 10 minutes a day, that's fine. That's enough. But make that time because you'll see that your day starts off a lot better than when you don't do it. Other than that, I always say journaling helps. Uh, it's very powerful because you write things away from yourself. Walk in nature, hug a tree, take a walk on the beach. Um, do do things that agree, with, again, with your spirit. For some, it may be running. Others, it may be being creative. It doesn't matter, but just do something different. Uh, what I did, actually, after my, my combo cleanse was I made a to-do list now, I had promised my stepdad back in 2000 that I would be running for cancer. That stayed a figment of my imagination for 16 years until I finally said, I am going to do this. And I started running. And, you know, from time to time here in the UK, I still run. But in the US, I did a lot. And... That's yeah, these are things I, I, I did. I, I went skydiving because I have a fear of heights. And I was, I'll tell you what, I nearly peed in my pants, but I did, <laughs> I did it. And I do remember the instructor telling me, Are you okay to do this? Are you scared? I'm like, Well, what am I going to do? Boom, <laughs> out of the plane. 
<laughs> so I was I was really glad when 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 the feet uh, when my feet touched the earth again. And that there were other things that that a lot of other things that I did, but it's that helps making a bucket list or things that you really want to do and you stick to it. Thank you, Brigitte. These are some wonderful things. And you gave quite a spectrum of things from simple, easy things like breathing mm-hmm. to skydiving. So, I mean, there's quite a range between there. There are many things that we can do that are going to help make a change. And so, again, I invite our listeners to choose something that works for them. Well, Brigitte, thank you so much for visiting with me today. I really appreciate it. No, thank you for having me. And I'll leave you with this. Uh, this quote actually it's very simple change your thinking change your life it's all about changing your mindset I love that and I always end with a quote so I'm going to take your quote and also add another quote to go with it and this is from Dieter F. Uchtdorf and he said healing comes when we choose to walk away from darkness and move towards a brighter light Today, I invite our listeners to choose to let go of darkness, heartache, and trauma of the past, and choose healing and light for the future. See you next time on Linda's Corner. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Linda's Corner, please share and subscribe to help us reach new listeners. I also invite you to check out my nonprofit, Hope for Healing, at the website hopeforhealingfoundation.org. I also invite you to grab a copy of one of my books, like Crushed, A Journey Through Depression, or Amazon bestseller, You Got This, an action plan to calm fear, anxiety, worry, and stress. See you next time on Linda's Corner.